session, which is on a diverse uh, collection of topics. So the first one is a talk by Andrzej Murawski on register automata. Thank you very much, Prakash, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, letting me uh, speak here. Um, so I would like to tell you about a selection of recent results concerning um, re uh, register um, automata, and they were obtained in joint work with uh, Stephen Ramsey and Nikos um, um, Alekos. Uh, so register automata um, are a class of automata over infinite alphabets. So the alphabet is now, instead of being a, a finite set, it is a countable set without really any structure. So we just use equality, and it's one of the sets that was mentioned in, in Nikolai's uh, um, talk. So I'm going to take you uh, through uh, some complexity results about these automata, uh, although first I'll explain why I'm really interested in, in these things. Uh, so I, I've picked results were. Uh, it turns out crucial to think about symmetries in order to arrive at uh, at optimal bounds or at least better bounds than than there is known known before. Uh, so there are many uh, reasons why one might be interested in uh, automata over infinite alphabets. Uh, well, it could be a natural extension of the standard formal language uh, theory. Um, um, automata over infinite alphabets play an important role in clarifying um, the power of, of um, uh, logics, uh, logics relevant to database theory. They're also useful in um, uh, well to drive XML um, processing. Uh, but I'm coming from, from a different uh, um, direction, namely, namely programming language semantics. Um, and there, uh, such automata become useful when we want to account for computational scenarios and in which um, an unbounded number of resources can be produced. So here I'm thinking about situations in which we can create references, uh, objects, uh, threads, and, and so on. So the semantics uh, uh, community have, has um, been working for years on, on capturing um, um, computation in a faithful way. And uh, uh, notably, thanks to game semantics, we now have a wide range of models that, uh, that are uh, perfect in some sense. So they are perfect in that they can be claimed to capture the essence of programs, um, well, in a, a very concrete way, known as the full abstraction property. Uh, so um, a model is called fully abstract if um, equality of interpretations, given here, um, coincides with um, well, the associated notion of program equivalence. So here, in a fully abstract model, we capture mathematically what it means for two programs to be equivalent. And uh, once uh, uh, we construct models of this kind, of course, we would like to uh, uh, use them to reason about um, equivalence. So this is our case. So after constructing uh, um, fully abstract game models of uh, say references, objects, and, and similar um, generative uh, phenomena, we wanted to see what what can be done with with these uh, with these models um, in the spirit of uh, verification, and we needed automata theoretic techniques to support representations of of um, such models. Um, okay, so um, my talk will um, focus on languages with with these generative uh, uh, phenomena, and in order to account for um, for them. Um, a new uh, branch of game semantics emerged uh, recently called nominal game semantics. That's uh, the refinement of, of the game models you may have heard about, game models from, from the 90s. They are refined in order to account for references, objects, and so on in a more uh, faithful um, uh, way. And in particular, um, nominal game semantics involves uh, an infinite set of names in uh, uh, in, in the process of, of playing games. So this infinite set um, um, can be used, uh, elements from this set can be used in, in moves. Um, and uh, well, of course, the fact that the set is infinite means that we can, we can model um, resource, resource creation. Uh, so here's a list of, of programming languages that's, that have been covered by nominal game semantics starting from simple languages that just create names and, and, and pass them and compare them uh, for equality, 
uh, through languages that have uh, all kinds of storage mechanisms, so for storing names, uh, for storing integer references, for storing high order references. Uh, so this is the language with, with um, exceptions. And, and uh, finally, we have, um, we have arrived at a fragment of, of Java called, known as middleweight Java in, 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 in the literature. So that's the, the um, semantics picture, but in, in the talk, um, I would like to focus on, on uh, using these models in practice. And here's an example. Uh, of, of the kind of thing that one would like to do in a fully automated uh, way. And uh, this actually becomes possible thanks to this marriage of, of nominal game semantics with, with a suitable automata um, a theory. Uh, so here are two terms, uh, very simple ones, uh, taken from the uh, ML uh, uh, language. So we have one term here and the second one here. And the first one uh, here creates a reference it's a private reference, will not be revealed. And that's why when um, the environment supplies a name to the program, this test uh, uh, will never succeed. So the outcome will be false because uh, well, the assumption is that the environment can never, can never guess the private name. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, consistent with what's going on in languages such as, um, say, Java or uh, ML. So this term, although it's, it creates references and so on, is actually equivalent to this term, calculating the constant function false. And uh, uh, well, we can convince ourselves that actually these, these two terms are equivalent by working out uh, the game semantic denotations of these terms. And uh, they will look like this. And game semantics uh, uh, plays are exchanges of moves between two players. Um, so these players correspond to the environment. So there's the context that uh, uh, that uh, will be interested in, in using uh, the program. And then the second player will be the, the program, um, the program itself. Uh, so here we, we have a simple exchange. So um, well, at the beginning, it's, it's just a, a, a handshake. So basically, the, these moves mean that we have arrived at, at a value. Um, the, the evaluation uh, was successful. So that's what the star means. Uh, and then the, the value, the function is being used. So here, the environment uh, uh, calls it on a reference name n1, uh, such that the uh, currently five is stored at this reference. And then as an outcome, we get uh, false. And, and then the, the value does not change, because this term does not do anything to, to the reference that is, that is, that is passed. Uh, so then the environment can uh, call the function again, perhaps on some different name. Uh, well, where 15 is stored, and uh, maybe in the process, uh, the environment also wants to modify the content of the previous name. But uh, in any case, the answer will be false, and then, uh, well, the store uh, will, uh, will, be, uh, will be the same. Uh, so if we run these terms through the game semantic engine, it turns out that in both cases, we obtain the same set of, of plays, and we can conclude that these terms are equivalent. So we would like to automate this, this process and be able to, uh, well, basically construct a tool that takes these terms and, and decides uh, these things uh, for us. Uh, so next, I'm going to uh, start talking about automata. And, and the focus will be on, uh, on equivalence problems. Uh, but I'm going to start with um, emptiness and reachability, because in, in many cases, uh, equivalence can be reduced to these problems. So, so these are the happy cases. Uh, and otherwise, I'll, I'll talk about equivalence problems such as language equivalence or um, uh, bisimilarity testing. Uh, so in our experience, uh, uh, two kinds of uh, automata turn out to be uh, suitable for representing uh, the game semantic denotations of, of terms. Uh, so of course, there is a point uh, uh, where uh, we cannot really hope to uh, decide equivalence. It gets uh, undecidable. But in the cases where um, we could show equivalence decidable, these, are, these will be the automata um, uh, that's, that will generate these, uh, that will, will be used uh, to underpin the decision uh, procedures. So register automata, and then I, I'm going to extend them slightly to, to push down register automata. 
So register automata is, is, a, is a modern name for a model called finite memory automata, uh, introduced by Kaminsky and Francis. And then a, a more modern presentation was used by Neven Fentik and Vianu. Uh, they are quite simple. Uh, so they have uh, finitely many states. And in addition, they have a fixed set of registers, um, R in my case. And then these registers can store elements of the um, infinite alphabet. And we uh, assume that different names have to be stored in different, in different uh, places in, in the registers. So the transitions are of, of the following shapes. Um, so we can play a name that is already in a register. Um, so by the way, the, the letters that's, uh, and that are being read by these automata um, are pairs. Um, so the first component is a tag taken from a finite alphabet, uh, so some kind of finite uh, template. And then the second element is a name drawn from the infinite alphabet. Right, so languages um, based on letters of this kind are called uh, data, data languages. Okay, so in register automata, we can have transitions that play names that are already in registers. And then there are also transitions that allow us to um, play names that's, uh, <coughs> that are fresh, that do not occur in a register, and after the transition, they will be, uh, they will be moved to register I. Right, so this transition could be viewed as, as name generation. We are generating something that's, that's not present in, in registers, and this is called local freshness. Um, uh, so one can also try to strengthen the models with global freshness, where we require that this name be completely fresh for the whole computation. Uh, but um, uh, let me uh, uh, skip uh, this feature in, in my talk because actually the complexity theoretic results are the same if we, if we add global freshness to, to the picture. Okay, so these models, they are based on, on, on names and they have some uh, nice uh, properties uh, um, related to well, symmetry and invariance. So first of all, if we have a run, uh, then if we take a permutation uh, on, on names, permutation on this infinite set of, of, of elements, uh, well, then we can construct another run. So runs are invariant. Um, and then uh, because we only have a fixed number of registers, R in my case, uh, these machines uh, cannot really uh, distinguish more than R plus one names. So what do I mean by this? Um, um, so here's, here's the statement. So whenever we have a run that reaches a state, it is possible to find another run that reaches um, the same state, but a run which only uses um, R plus one letters. Right, so this is because, uh, well, the automaton can only remember R names. So uh, if it needs a fresh one, we can always uh, supply well, the, the remaining one from the set of R plus one names, and we can, the automaton can, can still proceed and reach the, the desired state. So this, this, uh, um, this property actually gives a, a, an obvious reduction to the world of, of finite <coughs> alphabets, uh, which allows us to um, decide uh, the emptiness problem in, uh, in, uh, in this setting. Uh, so, uh, well, we can reduce it to reachability in uh, directed graphs and uh, Hence, the, the problem, the emptiness problem, is, uh, is NL, NL complete. So, of course, one would like to uh, solve other problems, uh, 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 notably the equivalence problem, but then um, there are difficulties with that in the general model. Um, so, ideally, uh, we would like to find that, that these, the languages accepted by such automata are, are closed under complementation and union and, and, and so on, which would um, allow us to um, reduce inclusion and equivalence to reachability, which we know is decidable, but uh, this is not what happens in this, uh, in this model. Uh, so even though the languages are closed under union and intersection, they are not closed under complementation. And actually, uh, uh, one can show, uh, as was done in a paper by Neven, Schwentig, and Vianu, that the inclusion problem for, the, uh, for these automata is, is undecidable. Uh, so actually, the, not, uh, not only inclusion, but also equivalence and universality. Okay, so that's bad news, but these undecidability results uh, depend on um, 
uh, uh, non-determinism. And in the deterministic case, one can, um, one can recover the, the properties I, uh, I, would like to, I would like to have because complementation can still be, can still be performed. So in the deterministic case, uh, inclusion and equivalence are decidable. And uh, uh, well, the obvious bounds that, that one can uh, extract from this reduction to finite alphabets is that, uh, 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 well, are these bounds, P space. Um, so these are, these are the obvious bounds. Uh, so it's, it's a bit less obvious to show that actually inclusion is P space complete. And uh, um, uh, we have managed to, uh, to obtain this nice result saying that equivalence of deterministic register automata is actually solvable in P um, rather than P space. Um, so in order to uh, arrive at, at this result, uh, we had to delve into bisimilarity. And so bisimilarity again is decidable and the decidability can be shown by, a, well, by the same reduction to finite alphabet, so we can blow up the automaton to, uh, uh, to a finite alphabet. But then this reduction is, is, is costly, leads to an exponential blow up. Uh, so the obvious uh, upper bound for bisimilarity is uh, exponential time. Uh, but then thanks to uh, uh, some group theoretic results and the structure <laughs> of the problem, we have managed to reduce it from x time to, uh, to, to np. So next, let, let, let me tell you uh, a bit more about uh, bisimilarity testing in, in this setting. Uh, so that's the concrete problem, right? Given two configurations, we would like to decide whether they are bisimilar. And uh, it's quite easy to see that, uh, um, well, uh, that in order to, um, uh, that if configurations are, are bisimilar, all, all that matters is, is, is the relationships between names that are in one uh, set of registers and the names inside the other set of registers. So bisimilarity can be accounted for in a uh, symbolic way, uh, where we are actually talking about bisimilarity of states up to a, a, a permutation, although it's, it's not a permutation, it's a partial permutation, because uh, these, the contents of these registers uh, do not, do not um, have to match. So we have uh, uh, well defined a suitable um, notion of symbolic bisimilarity that uh, captures this problem. And uh, uh, we looked at the structural properties of, of that concept, which turned out quite fruitful because we managed to, uh, uh, to get better complexity bounds. So here are some crucial properties of the symbolic bisimilarity. It's closed on the composition. So this is the composition of, of partial uh, permutations. Uh, it is also monotone in this sense. So if two states are bisimilar uh, under the assumption that the names uh, match according to sigma, uh, it turns out that if we have, if we take a bigger matching, then they will also be bisimilar. So the, this, this symbolic concept behaves well with respect to um, composition and mon monotonicity. Actually, uh, in order to find an, uh, um, a proof of, of membership in P, uh, we would like to use these facts to uh, find, uh, well, small um, generating uh, sets. Um, so this, this generation will be uh, with respect to uh, composition, but then we, also, we are also going to take advantage of this monotonicity. And uh, um, it's, it's really less trivial to see how to do that because uh, we cannot really uh, intersect two to partial, um, to partial uh, permutations. Uh, right, so in order to uh, uh, investigate the problem and find these, these small generating sets, uh, well, we looked at uh, the set of partial permutations um, that make the same state by similar. So this, this, this is the set of, of partial auto uh, symmetries. And it turned out that this set has a very nice uh, 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 structure. Uh, so the, the property related to, to generating things in, in partial permutations are not uh, good enough to give the results that we are after. So, uh, well, we had to try to observe a bit more uh, uh, about this set. And uh, uh, well, in this spirit, it turned out uh, fruitful to, to uh, have a look at uh, the kinds of partial identities that uh, underpin by similarity. And, uh, oh, right, um, a few minutes. 
Um, so, right, so, so, so thanks to investigations about these partial symmetries, we managed to uh, identify a group that underpins um, um, this set, even though this is a set of, um, of, partial, of partial permutations. Uh, so uh, if we cut down uh, this set to, uh, to uh, um, right, if, we, if we count that by similarity to pairs uh, living in this set, uh, then we get a group, and then we can try to use results from group theory to, uh, to investigate um, this process. Uh, so this is the first result that turns out useful. Uh, so it is known that uh, uh, if we take a symmetric group, then uh, strict chains of subgroups uh, um, have length linear in, um, in, in R, where R is, is the number of, of elements. Um, so why is this result important? Well, it is known that by similarity can be obtained in an iterative way by investigating what happens after zero steps, one step, two steps, uh, and so on. And it turns out that in our setting, this, uh, uh, well, this, the, the, this, the, this process of zooming in on um, the largest uh, by similarity can be linked to, um, uh, to the shrinkage of subgroups. Right? So thanks to the result, uh, basically we can conclude that this, this chain of relations will stabilize um, after pol polynomially many steps. So if we know that by similarity can be obtained by investigating polynomially relations of polynomially many relations of this kind, uh, it's easy to see that uh, we can decide it in alternating p time, and uh, well, this is this is p space. So this already gives us something better than um, than x time, which which was the obvious bound. Uh, so there's another uh, result in group theory that turns out helpful. So this result says that every subgroup of um, the symmetric group over R elements has at most, uh, well, this uh, linear number of generators. Okay, so for, for each group that underpins these uh, by similarity relations that we were investigating, we can find uh, linearly many generators. Okay, but this, is the, this does not automatically lead to an NP algorithm because these groups were just related to uh, symmetries of the same state, so they were, they were auto-symmetries, whereas we also need to cover uh, situations where uh, we have different states. But fortunately, thanks to compositionality, this, this, uh, this, uh, this can be done, and we can show that it suffices uh, to provide just one witness if these two states are related by some partial permutation. So on the whole, we um, can conclude that uh, the symbolic bisimilarity has a generating set of polynomial size, um, which means, well, we can now guess it. And what's more, uh, we can check that this is indeed a, a generating set of, of, of a bisimulation relation uh, using, um, well, this third result from group theory, which says the group membership testing uh, can be done in, in polynomial time. So overall, we can conclude that by similarity testing for register automata um, is an NP, and we do not have a matching uh, lower bound, which is um, intriguing. Uh, so now all these techniques can be put to use and, and, uh, in order to show that the equivalence of deterministic register automata uh, is in P, uh, why, is, uh, why is that? So in this NP result, we have to guess um, this generating set. Um, but for deterministic register automata, we can actually generate it. And this is a modification of a known algorithm for deterministic finite automata due to Hopcroft and, 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 and Carr. Okay, so these were register automata, which turned I'm sorry, out. Did you say something about the containment of deterministic register automata? Uh, yes, uh, several slides back. It's it's decidable it? and p-space complete. P space complete. Okay. okay, so we we have a situation it's where where the complete. complexities are, are are different, which which doesn't uh, kind of happen very very often. And about the the one that have the NP upper bound, is it conceivable it's an NP intersection? <coughs> about non yeah, we haven't managed to make any progress on this. It seems to us this might be related to, uh, to graph isomorphism. We, we looked at uh, N, C, um, yeah, we, yeah, we don't have a good guess. Could, could be in P even. We, we don't know. 
And OK, so a second class of, of automata that turned out useful for representing these game semantic models are pushdown register automata. They extend register automata with a, uh, with a, with a stack. Uh, so again, the, they operate over infinite alphabets. Um, and one would like to reduce the emptiness problem to the finite world again. But now it's not so clear um, how many letters are needed to do that because stack is, the stack is potentially unbounded. So the previous result saying that R plus one element suffice is, 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 is not good. Uh, so Cheng and Kaminsky, who introduced these machines, um, they did show um, the citability of, of, of emptiness, but uh, the proof went through several stages. Actually, the, the number of, of, of letters that is needed to perform the reduction was, was lost somewhere. And, and uh, uh, later on, other authors uh, noted that uh, it's not apparent how to determine the number from the definition of the automata. Uh, so we, we made progress on this question. It turned out that the magic number is, uh, is uh, three times the number of registers. So I, I don't have enough time to, to explain this, but uh, um, this result immediately implies that reachability in pushdown register automata is uh, decidable and uh, uh, can be, can be uh, uh, and the problem can be uh, the problem is in, in um, exponential time. Uh, so in contrast, when one looks at bisimilarity, it turns out to be undecidable, which is uh, perhaps a, a, a quite a disappointment because in the finite world. Although it was hard, it was known to be decidable. Uh, so then, uh, well, in order to, to uh, 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 do a bit more about stacks, we also looked at high order pushdown automata. So these are automata that have stacks of stacks and, and so on. And uh, so these automata are also undecidable in, in the with over the infinite uh, alphabet. So using um, these automata and actually these, these variations uh, with global freshness capable of generating truly fresh elements, uh, well, we, uh, we showed a number of decidability results uh, for uh, these languages, fragments of ML and, and Java. And actually, uh, for, in some cases, we constructed, uh, we constructed tools that can decide equivalence um, um, in a fully, fully automated fashion. So, Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so uh, actually this, this, this is, I think, my last slide. Um, so I talked about um, register automata and push down register automata in the context of modeling uh, this generative um, computation. Uh, so within semantics, uh, uh, automata over infinite alphabets also emerged for um, a different reason, and this is to model higher order computation. So if we look at this type, say, Okay, it's a, it's a nice first order type. Uh, uh, seems quite simple, but actually it generates lots of complicated interactions because if we apply terms of, of this type to arguments, we're going to get functions and, and each of these functions can be uh, called again. Uh, so, so this phenomenon could be captured with this pattern. Uh, so, so this is just a handshake, but here we are um, applying the term of this kind uh, once, um, we apply it twice and, and then again. So here we, we had three applications. Each of them uh, led to a function of type unit, arrow unit. And finally, we may wish to call one of these functions again. So in order to call them, we need to indicate which one uh, um, do we want to call. Is it the first one, the second one, or the third one? And in game semantics, this is done with pointers. Uh, so now if, if one wants to model this in an auto automata theoretic way, it makes sense to use, uh, to use names to, um, to, to indicate at which copy we actually uh, want to point. So for instance, because here we want to point at that occurrence, we would use the same uh, names to account for, for this situation. So the, the, the data word that corresponds to this scenario um, looks, looks like this. So in this context, uh, uh, different classes of automata over infinite alphabet turned out useful. And these are variations of the class memory automata due to um, Birkund and, and, uh, and, and, and Schwentig. Uh, so they have a completely different flavor and the decision problems are related to um, problems on Petri nets, uh, actually extensions of Petri nets uh, such as nasty pet uh, nested Petri nets and variants that use branching. So actually in this area, the modeling of high order computation uh, certain equivalence problems that arise from work on high-order programs 
uh, can be shown to be equivalent to open problems in um, this area of, uh, for instance, uh, branching, branching Petri nets. And uh, this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Your game semantics problem, do you also have trees pop up? And so, um, well, I mean, they're, they're not uh, uh, arising explicitly, but actually in, in, in this work, uh, we were able to identify a fragment that was equivalent to branching Petri nets. So in, 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 in this way, the trees arise in, in implicitly. Okay, let's thank Andre again. <laughs>